When Cortez sent the standard bearer Corral and two other captains named Juan Jaramillo and Pedro de Ircio and me, who happened to be there with them to ascend the hill and see what the stronghold was like, whether there were many Indians wounded or killed by the arrows and muskets, and how many people were gathered there. When he gave us these orders, he said, Look to it, sirs, that you do not take from them a single grain of maize. As I understood it, he meant that we should help ourselves, and it was for that reason that he sent us and told me to go with the others. We ascended the hill by a track, and I must say that it was stronger than the first hill, for it was sheer rock, and when we reached the top, the entrance into the stronghold was no wider than two mouths of a silo or an oven. At the very top, it was level ground, and there was a great breadth of meadowland, all crowded with people, both warriors and many women and children, and we found twenty dead men and many wounded, and they had not a drop of water to drink. All their clothes and other property was done up in bundles, and there were many bales of cloaks, which were the tribute they paid to Watanuk. And when I saw so many loads of cloth, and knew that it was intended for tribute, I began to load floor to Lash Collins, my free servants whom I had brought with me, and I also put four other bales on the backs of four other Indians who were guarding the tribute, one bale on each man's back. When Pedro de Ercio saw this, he said that the bale should not be taken, and I contended that they should, but as he was captain, I did as he ordered, for he threatened to tell Cortez about it. Pedro de Ercio said to me that I had heard what Cortez had said, that we should not take a single grain of maize, and I replied that it was true, and that it was on account of those very words I wished to carry off these robes. However, he would not let me carry off anything at all, and we went down to tell Cortez what we had seen. Then Pedro de Ercio said to Cortez, I took nothing from them, although Bernal Diaz de Castillo had already laden eight Indians with cloth, and would have brought them away loaded had I not stopped him. Then Cortez replied half angrily, Why did he not bring them? You ought to have stayed there with the cloths and the Indians. And he added, See how they understand me? I send them to help themselves, and from Bernal Diaz, who did understand me, they took away the spoil which he was taking from those dogs who will sit there laughing at us in the company of those whom we have killed and wounded. When Pedro de Ercio heard this, he wished to go up to the stronghold again, but he was told that there was no reason for his going, and that on no account should he return there. Let us leave this talk and say that the people from the other hill came in, and after much discussion about their being pardoned for their past deeds, all gave their fealty to his majesty. As there was no water in that place, we went at once to a fine pueblo already mentioned by me in the last chapter, called Watepec. Where is the garden which I gave, for has said is the best that I have ever seen in all my life. And so said the treasurer Aldorete and the monk Fray Pedro Medrejo and Don Cortez. When they saw it and walked about in it, they admired it greatly, and said that they had never seen a better garden in Spain. I must add that we all found quarters in the garden that night. The caciques of the town came to speak and offer their services to Cortez, for Gonzalo de Sandoval had already brought them to peace when he entered the town. That night we slept there, and the next morning, very early, we left for Yotobek, and we met some squadrons of Mexicans who had come out from that town, and the horsemen pursued them more than a league and a half until they took refuge in another large pueblo called Tepochtlan, where the inhabitants were so completely off their guard that we fell upon them before their spies, whom they had sent to watch us, could reach them. Here we found some very good-looking Indian women, and much spoil, but none of the Mexicans nor any of the inhabitants waited for us in the town, so Cortez sent three or four times to some of the caciques to come and make peace, and said that if they did not come he would burn the town and go in search of them. They replied that they did not mean to come, therefore so as to strike fear to the other pueblos, Cortez ordered half the houses round about to be set on fire. At that very moment the caciques from the pueblo that we have passed that day, called Yatapec, came and gave their fealty to his majesty. The next day we took the road for a much better and larger town named Cuadlabaca. At the present time we usually alter the spelling and call it Cuadlabaca. And it was garrisoned by many warriors, both Mexican and native, and was very strong on account of the barrancas, more than eight fathoms deep, with running water at the bottom. But the volume of water is small. However, they make the place into a stronghold and... There was no way of entering for horses except by two bridges, which had already been broken down. This protection was sufficient to prevent our forcing an entrance, so we fought with them from across the stream and ravine. 
and they shot many arrows and lances at us and hurled stones from their slings so that they fell thicker than hail. While this was happening, Cortez was informed that about half a league further on, there was a place where horses could pass, and he at once set off with all the horsemen, while all of us remained looking for some way to get across, and we saw that by means of some trees which stood near the edge, one could get over to the other side of that deep ravine, and although three soldiers fell from the trees into the water below, and one of them broke his leg, nevertheless we did cross over, although the danger was great. As for me, I will say truly that when I was crossing and saw how bad and dangerous the passage was, I turned quite giddy. Still, I got across, I and others of our soldiers and many Tlaxcalans, and we fell in the rear of the Mexicans, who were shooting stones and darts and arrows at our people, and when they saw us, they could not believe it and thought that we were more numerous than we were. At that moment, Cristobal de Olid and André de Tapia and other horsemen who at great risk had crossed by a broken bridge arrived on the scene, and we fell on the enemy so that they turned their backs and fled into the thickets about the deep ravine, where we could not reach them. Soon afterwards, Cortez himself arrived with the rest of the horsemen. In this town, we took great spoil, both of large bales of cloth as well as good-looking women. Cortez ordered us to remain there that day, and we all found quarters in the beautiful garden of the chief of the town. Though I feel bound to speak many times in the course of the story about the great precautions of sentinels, spies, and scouts, which were taken wherever we were, whether encamped or on the march, it would be tedious to repeat it too often. And for this reason I will go on and say that our scouts came to tell Cortez that twenty Indians were approaching, that from their movements and appearance they seemed to be caciques and chieftains who were bringing messages or coming to seek for peace. They proved to be the caciques of the town, and when they arrived where Cortez was standing, they paid him great respect and presented him with some gold jewels and asked him to pardon them for not meeting him peacefully. But they said the Lord of Mexico commanded them to stay in their stronghold and thence to make war on us and had sent a large force of Mexicans to aid them. But from what they had now seen, there was no place, however strong it might be, that we would not attack and dominate. And they begged Cortez to have mercy and make peace with them. Cortez received them graciously, and they then gave their fealty to his majesty. The next day we set out toward Xochimilco, which is a great city where nearly all the houses are built in a freshwater lake, distant about two and a half leagues from Mexico. We marched with great circumspection and in close order, and we passed through some pine forests, but there was no water whatever along the road. As we carried our arms on our backs, and it was already late, and the sun was very hot, we suffered much from thirst, but we did not know if there was any water ahead of us, for we had marched two or three leagues, and we were still uncertain how far off was the pool which we had been told was on the road. When Cortez saw that the whole of the army was tired out, and our allies, the Flash Collins, were dispirited, and one of them had died of thirst. I believe one of our soldiers, who was old and ailing, also died of thirst. He ordered a halt to be made in the shade of some pine trees, and sent six horsemen ahead on the road to Xochimilco to see how far off the nearest village or farm or pool of water might be, so that we might know if it were near and might go and sleep there. When the horsemen set out, I made up my mind to step aside so that neither Cortez nor the horsemen should see me, and with my three strong and active Tlaxcalan servants, I followed behind the horsemen, until they observed me coming behind them, and stopped in order to turn me back for fear that there should be some unexpected attack by Mexican warriors from which I could not defend myself. Nevertheless, I preferred to go on with them, and Cristobal de Olid, as he was a friend of mine, said that I might go, but should keep my hands ready to fight and my feet ready to place myself in safety if there was any fear of warriors. However, my thirst was so great that I would have risked my life to satisfy it. About half a league ahead, there were a number of farms and cottages on the hillside belonging to the people of Xochimilco. The horsemen left me and went to search for pools of water, and they found some and satisfied their thirst, and one of my Tlaxcalans brought out of a house a large pitcher of very cold water, for well, they have very large pitchers in that country, from which I quenched my thirst, and so did they. Then I determined to return to where Cortez was resting, for the dwellers in the farms were already giving the call to arms and shouting and whistling at us. With the help of the Tlaxcalans, I carried along the pitcher full of water, and I found Cortez, who was beginning to march again with his army. I told him that there was water at the farms nearby, 
and that I already had a drink and was bringing water in a pitcher, which the flash columns were bringing very carefully hidden, so that it should not be taken from me, for thirst has no laws. And Cortez and some of the other gentlemen drank from it, and he was well satisfied, and all were rejoiced and hastened on their march, so we arrived at the farms before the sun had set. Water was found in the houses, but not very much of it, and owing to the hunger and thirst that they suffered, some of the soldiers ate some plants like thistles, which hurt their tongues and mouths. Just then the horsemen returned and reported that the pool of water was a long way off, and that all the country was being called to arms, and that it would be advisable to sleep where we were. So sentinels and watchmen and scouts were at once posted, and I was one of the watchmen. I remember that it rained a little that night, and there was a very high wind. The next day, very early in the morning, we began our march again, and about eight o'clock, we arrived at Xochimilco. I cannot estimate the great number of warriors who were waiting for us, some on the land, and others in a passage by a broken bridge, and the great number of breastworks and barricades which had been thrown up, and the lances which they carried made from the swords captured from us during the great slaughter on the causeways at Mexico. I say that all the mainland was covered with these warriors, and at the passage of that bridge we were fighting them for more than half an hour and could not get through. Neither muskets nor crossbows, nor the many great charges that we made were of any avail, and the worst of all was that many other squadrons of them were all when we saw that, we dashed through the water and bridge, some half swimming and others jumping, and here some of our soldiers, much against their will, had perforce to drink so much of the water beneath the bridge that their bellies were swollen up from it. To go back to the battle, at the passage of the bridge many of our soldiers were wounded, but we soon brought the enemy to the sword's point along some streets where there was one solid ground ahead of us. Cortez and the horsemen turned in another direction on the mainland, where they came on more than 10,000 Indians, all Mexicans, who had come as reinforcements to help the people in the city. And they fought in such a way with our troops that with their lances and rest, they awaited the attack of the horsemen and wounded four of them. Cortez was in the middle of the press, and the horse he was riding, which was a very good one, a dark chestnut called El Romo, the flat-nosed, either because he was too fat or was tired, for he was a pampered horse, broke down, and the Mexican warriors, who were around in great numbers, laid hold of Cortez and dragged him from the horse. Others say that by sheer strength they threw the horse down. Whichever way it may have happened, Cortez and the horse fell to the ground, and at that very moment many more Mexican warriors pressed up to see if they could carry him off alive, when some Clash Collins and also a very valiant soldier named Cristobal de Olea saw what had happened. They at once came up and with good cuts and thrusts cleared a space so that Cortez could mount again, although he was badly wounded in the head. Olea was also very badly wounded with three sword cuts. By that time, all of us soldiers who were anywhere near came to their help. At that time, as every street in the city was crowded with squadrons of warriors, and as we were obliged to follow their banners, we were not able all to keep together, but some of us to attack in some places, and some of us in others, as Cortez commanded us. However, we all knew from the shouts and cries, yells and whistles, that where Cortez and the horsemen were engaged, the fight was hottest, and without any further explanation, although there were swarms of warriors round us, we went at great risk to ourselves to join Cortez. Fifteen horsemen had already joined him, and were fighting near some canals where the enemy had thrown up breastworks and barricades. When we came up, we put the Mahicans to flight, but not all of them turned their backs on us. And because the soldier Olea who had helped Cortez was very badly wounded with three sword cuts and was bleeding, and because the streets of the city were crowded with warriors, we advised Cortez to turn back to some barricades so that he and Olea and the horse might be attended to. So we turned back, but not without anxiety on account of the stones, arrows, and javelins which they fired at us from the barricades, for the Mexicans thought that we were turning to retreat, and they followed us with great fury. At this moment... Andre de Tapia and Cristobal de Olid came up, and all the rest of the horsemen who had gone off with them in other directions. Blood was streaming down Olid's face, and from his horse, and from all the rest of them, for everyone was wounded, and they said that they had been fighting against such a host of Mexicans in the open fields that they could make no headway against them. For when we had passed the bridge, which I have mentioned, it seems the Cortez had divided the horsemen so that half went in one direction and half in the other, 
one half following one set of squadrons and the other half another set of squadrons. While we were treating the wounds by searing them with oil, there was a great noise of yells, trumpets, shells, and drums from some of the streets on the mainland, and along them came a host of Mexicans into the court where we were attending the wounded, and they let fly such a number of javelins and stones that they had once wounded many of our soldiers. However, the enemy did not come very well out of that incursion. We charged on them, and with good cuts and thrusts, we left most of them stretched out on the ground. The horsemen, too, were not slow in riding out to attack, and killed many of them, but two of the horses were wounded. We drove them out of that court, and when Cortez saw that there were no more of the enemy, we went to rest in another great court, where stood the great oratories of the city. Many of our soldiers ascended the highest temple where the idols were kept, and from thence looked over the great city of Mexico and the lakes, but one had a commanding view of it all, and they could see approaching more than 2,000 canoes full of warriors who were coming straight toward us from Mexico. Later on, we learned that Guatemoc had sent them to attack us that night or next day, and at the same time, he sent another 10,000 warriors by land so that by attacking us both on one side and the other, not one of us should get out of the city alive. He had also got ready another 10,000 men as a reinforcement when the attack was made, all this we found out on the following day from five Mexican captains who were captured during the battle. However, our Lord ordained that it should be otherwise, for when that great fleet of canoes was observed and it was known that they were coming to attack us, we agreed to keep a very good watch throughout the camp, especially at the landing places and canals where they had to disembark. The horsemen were waiting very much on the alert all night through, with the horses saddled and bridled on the causeway and on the mainland, and Cortez and all his captains were keeping watch and going the rounds all night long. I and two other soldiers were posted as sentinels on some masonry walls, and we had got together many stones where we had posted, and the soldiers of our company were provided with crossbows and muskets and long lances, so that the enemy could reach the landing place on the canals, we would resist them and make them turn back. While my companions and I were watching, we heard a sound of many canoes being paddled, although they approached with muffled paddles to disembark at the landing place where we were posted, and with a good shower of stones and with the lances we opposed them so that they did not dare to disembark. We sent one of our companions to give warning to Cortez, and while this was happening there again approached many more canoes laden with warriors, and they began to shoot darts and stones and arrows at us, and as we again opposed them, two of our soldiers were wounded in the head, but as it was night time and very dark, the canoes went to join the captains of the whole fleet of canoes, and they all went off together to disembark at another landing place, where the canals were deeper. Then, as they were not used to fighting during the night, they all went to join the squadrons that Guatemoc had sent by land, which already numbered more than 15,000 Indians. I also wish to relate, but not for the purpose of boasting about it, that when our companions went to report to Cortez that many canoes full of warriors had reached the landing place where we were watching, Cortez himself, accompanied by ten horsemen, came at once to speak to us, and as he came close by us without speaking, we cried out, I and Gonzalo Sanchez, the Portuguese from El Garve, and we shouted, Who comes there? Are not you able to speak? What do you want? And we threw three or four stones at him. When Cortez recognized my voice and that of my companion, he paid to the treasurer Julian de Alderete and to Fray Pedro Melgarejo and Cristobal de Olid, who were accompanying him on his rounds, we need no further security here than the two men who are here stationed as watchmen. They are men who have been with me from the earliest times, and we can fully trust them to keep a good lookout, even in a case of still greater danger. And then they spoke to us and explained the danger that was threatening us. In the same way, without saying more to us, they went on to examine the other outposts, and we heard how they flogged two soldiers who were lounging through their watch. These were some of Narvaez's men. There is another matter which I call to mind, which is that our musketeers had no more powder, and the crossbowmen no arrows, for on the day before they had fired so quickly that all had been used up. That same night Cortez ordered the crossbowmen to get ready all the arrows they possessed, and to feather them and fix on the arrowheads, for on these expeditions we always carried many loads of materials for arrows, and over five loads of arrowheads made of copper, so we could always make arrows when they were so all that night every crossbowman was occupied feathering and putting heads on the arrows, and Pedro Barba, who was their captain, never ceased from overseeing the work, 
and from time to time, Cortez assisted him. As soon as there was daylight, we saw all the Mexican squadrons closing in on the court where we were encamped, and as they never caught us napping, the horsemen in one direction where there was firm ground, and we and our Tlaxcalan allies in another charged through them and killed and wounded three of their captains who died the next day, and our allies made a good capture and took as prisoners five chieftains from whom we learned what orders had been given by Guatemoc. Many of our soldiers were wounded in that battle, but this encounter was not the end of the fighting, for our horsemen, following on the heels of the enemy, came on the 10,000 warriors whom Guatemoc had sent as reinforcements. The Mexican captains who came with this force carried swords captured from us and made many demonstrations of the valor with which they would use them, saying they would slay us with our own arms. When our horsemen, who were few in number, found themselves close to the enemy and saw the great number of squadrons, they feared to attack them, and they moved aside so as not to meet them until Cortez and all of us should come to their aid. When we heard of this, without a moment's delay, all the horsemen who were left mounted their horses, although both men and horses were wounded, and all the soldiers and crossbowmen on our Tlaxcalan allies marched out, and we charged in such a way that we broke the ranks of the enemy and got at them hand to hand, and with good swordplay made them abandon their unlucky enterprise and leave us the field of battle. We captured some other chieftains there and heard from them that Guatemoc had ordered another great flotilla of canoes to be dispatched and was sending many more warriors by land and had said to his warriors that when we were weary from our recent encounters and had many dead and wounded, we would become careless, thinking that no more squadrons would be sent against us and that with the large force he was then sending, they would be able to defeat us. When this was known, if we had been on the alert before we were much more so now, and it was agreed that the next day we should leave the city and not wait for more attacks. That day we spent in attending to the wounded, and in cleaning our arms, and making arrows. It appears that in this city there were so many rich men, who had very large houses full of mantles and cloth and Indian cotton shirts, and they possessed gold and feather work and much other property. It so happened that while we were occupied, as I have described, the Tlaxcalans and some of our soldiers chanced to find out in what part of the town these houses were situated, and some of the Zhokamilko prisoners went with them to point them out. These houses stood in the freshwater lake, and one could reach them by a causeway, but there were two or three small bridges in the causeway where it crossed some deep canals, and as our soldiers went to the houses and found them full of cloth, and no one was guarding them, they loaded themselves and many of the flesh callans with the cloth and the gold ornaments, and they came with it to the camp. Some of the other soldiers, when they saw this, also set out for the houses, but while they were inside taking the cloth out of some huge wooden boxes, at that very moment a great flotilla of canoes arrived full of Indians from Mexico, who fell upon them and wounded many of the soldiers, and carried off four of them alive, and took them to Mexico, but the rest escaped. When these four soldiers were taken to Guatemoc, he learned how few of us there w or we were who had come with Cortez, and that many of us were wounded, and all that he wished to know about our journey. When we had thoroughly informed him about all this, he ordered the arms, feet, and heads of our unfortunate companions to be cut off, and sent them to the towns of our allies, to those that had already made peace with us and he sent to tell them that he did not think there would be one of us left alive to return to Texcoco. The hearts and blood were offered to the idols. Let us leave this topic and say how he had once sent many fleets of canoes full of warriors and other companies by land, and told them to see to it that we did not leave Xochimilco alive. As I am tired of writing about the many battles and encounters which we fought against the Mexicans in those days, and yet cannot omit to mention them, I will say that as soon as dawn broke, there came such a host of Mexicans by the waterways and others by the causeways and by the mainland that we could hardly break them up. So we then went out from the city to a great plaza, where stood at a little distance from the town, where they were used to hold their markets, and halted there with all our baggage ready for the march. Cortez then began to make us a speech about the danger in which we were placed, for we knew for certain that in the bad passes on the roads, 
at the creeks, on the canals, the whole power of Mexico and its allies would be lying in wait for us, and it told us that it would be a good thing, and it was his command that we should march unencumbered, and should leave the baggage and the cloths, so that it should not impede us when it came to fighting. When we heard this with one voice, we answered that, please God, we were men enough to defend our property, and persons, and his also, and that it would show great cowardice to do such a thing. When Cortez knew our wishes and heard our reply, he said that he prayed God to help us, and then, knowing the strength and power of the enemy, we arranged the order of march, the baggage of the wounded in the middle. The horsemen divided so that half of them marched ahead and half as a rear guard. The crossbowmen and our native allies we also placed in the middle as security, for the Mexicans were accustomed to attack the baggage. Of the musketeers, we did not take much count, for they had no powder left. In this order we began our march, and when the squadrons of Mexicans whom Guatemoc had sent out that day saw us retreating from Xochimilco, they thought that it was from fear and that we did not dare to meet them, which was true, and so great a host of them started off at once and came directly against us that they wounded eight soldiers, of whom two died within eight days, and they thought to defeat us and break into the baggage, but as we marched in the order I have described, they were not able to do it. However, all along the road, until we reached a large town called Coyoacan, about two leagues distant from Xochimilco, the warriors never ceased to make sudden attacks on us from positions where we could not well get at them, but whence they could assail us with javelins and stones and arrows, and then take refuge in the neighboring creeks and ditches. When we arrived at Coyoacan about ten o'clock in the morning, we found it deserted. As this large town stands on level ground, we determined to rest there that day, and the next, so as to attend to the wounded and to make arrows, for we understood very well that we should have to fight more battles before returning to our camp at Texcoco. Next day, but one early in the morning, we began our march, following the road to Tacuba, which stands about two leagues from our starting place. At one place on the road, Many squadrons of warriors divided into three parties came out to attack us, but we resisted all three attacks, and the horsemen followed the enemy over the level ground until they took refuge in the creeks and canals. As we kept on our way, Cortez left us with ten thousand horsemen and four pages, intending to prepare an ambush for the Mexicans who came out from the creeks and made attacks on us. The Mexicans pretended that they were running away, and Cortez with the horsemen and servants followed them. Then Cortez saw that there was a large force of the enemy placed in ambush, who fell upon him and his horsemen, and wounded some horses, and if they had not retreated at once, they would all have been killed or taken prisoner. As it was, the Mexicans carried off two alive, out of the four soldiers who were pages to Cortez, and they carried them to Guatemala, who had them sacrificed. We arrived at Tacuba, with our banners flying, and with all the army in the baggage. The rest of the horsemen had come in with Pedro de Alvarado and Cristobal de Olid, but Cortez and the ten horsemen who were with him did not appear, and we had n an uncomfortable suspicion that some disaster might have overtaken him. Then Pedro de Alvarado and Cristobal de Olid and other horsemen went in search of him, in the direction of the creeks where we had seen him turn off. At that moment the other two pages who had gone with Cortez and who had escaped with their lives came into camp, and they told us all that I have already related and said that they had escaped because they were fleet of foot, and that Cortez and the others were following slowly because their horses were wounded. While we were talking, Cortez appeared, at which we all rejoiced, although he had arrived very sad and almost tearful. When we reached Tacuba, it rained heavily, and we took shelter for nearly two hours in some large courts, and Cortez, with some other captains and many of us soldiers, ascended the lofty temple of that town whence one had a good view of the city of Mexicans, which is quite near, and of the lake and the other cities which are built in the water. We continued our march and passed by Atzacobotzalco, which we found to be deserted, and went on to Tenayuca. This town was also deserted, from thence we went to Guaititlan, and throughout the day it never ceased raining with heavy rainstorms, and as we marched with our arms shouldered and never took off our harness by day or night, what with the weight and the soaking we got, we were quite broken down. We arrived at that large town when night was falling, but it also was deserted. 
It never ceased raining all night long, and the mud was very deep. The natives of the place and some squadrons of Mexicans yelled at us all night from the canals and other places where it could do them no harm. As it was raining and very dark, no sentinels could be posted or rounds made, and no order was kept, nor could we find those who were posted. And this I can myself assert, for they stationed me as a watchman for the first watch, and neither officer nor patrol visited me. And so it was throughout the camp. Let us leave this carelessness and say that the next day we continued our march to another large pueblo, of which I do not remember the name. The mud was very deep in it, and we found it deserted. The following day we passed by other deserted pueblos, and the day after we reached a pueblo called Aculman, subject to Texcoco. When they knew in Texcoco that we were coming, they came out to receive Cortez, and there were many Spaniards who had lately come from Spain. Captain Gonzalo de Sandoval with many soldiers also came out to receive us, and with him came the Lord of Texcoco. Cortez had a good reception both from our own people and from those recently come from Spain, and a still more cordial reception from the natives of the neighboring towns, who at once brought food. That night, Sandoval returned to Texcoco with all his soldiers to protect his camp, and the next morning Cortez and all of us continued our march to Texcoco. So we marched on, weary and wounded, and left many of our soldier companions behind us dead, or in the power of the Mexicans to be sacrificed, and instead of resting and curing our wounds, we had to meet a conspiracy organized by certain persons of quality, who were partisans of Narve for the purpose of killing Cortez and Gonzalo de Sandoval, Pedro de Alvarado, and Antone de Tapia. As I've already said, we returned broken up and wounded from the expedition that I've recorded. It appears that a great friend of the governor of Cuba, named Antonio de Villafagna, a native of Zamora or Toro, planned with other soldiers of the party of Narve, I will not mention their names for their honor's sake, that when Cortez should thus return from that expedition, they would kill him with dagger thrusts. As a Spanish ship had arrived at that time, it was to happen in this way, when Cortez should be seated at the table dining with his captains, one of the persons who had made the plot should bring him a letter firmly closed up and sealed as though it came from Castile, and should say that it came from his father, Martin Cortez, and that he was reading it, they should stab him with daggers, both Cortez and all the captains and soldiers who should happen to be near him and would defend him. When all that I have spoken about had already been talked over and prepared, it pleased our Lord that those who had arranged it should give a share in the affair to two important persons, I wish also to avoid mentioning their names, who had gone on the expeditions with us, and in the plan that had been made, they had named one of these persons to be Captain General when they killed Cortez, and the other soldiers of the party of Narve they appointed Chief Alguacil and Ensign, and Alcaldes, Magistrates, Treasurer, and Inspector, and other officers of that sort, and they had even divided among themselves our property and horses, and this plot was kept secret until two days after our arrival at Tushkoko. It pleased our Lord God that such a thing should not come to pass, for New Spain would have been lost and all of us, for parties and follies, would have sprung up at once. It seems that a soldier divulged the plot to Cortez, who had once put a stop to it before more fuel could be added to the fire, for that good soldier asserted that many persons of quality were concerned in it. When Cortez knew of it, after making great promises and gifts which he gave to the man who disclosed it to him, he had once secretly informed all our captains namely Pedro de Alvarado, Francisco de Lugo, Cristobal de Olid, Andre de Tapia, Gonzalo de Sandoval, and me, and the two alcaldes who were on duty that year, namely Luis Marin and Pedro de Ircio, and all of us who were adherents of Cortez. As soon as we knew about it, we got ready, and without further delay went with Cortez to the lodging of Antonio de Villafagna, and there were present with him many of those who were in the conspiracy, and with the aid of four alguaciles whom Cortez had, been, had brought with him, he promptly laid hands on Villafania, and the captains and soldiers who were with him at once began to flee, and Cortez ordered them to be seized and detained. As soon as we held Villafania a prisoner, Cortez drew from his, Villafania's breast, the memorandum which he possessed with the signatures of all who were in the conspiracy, and after he had read it and had seen that there were many persons of quality in it, so as not to dishonor them, he spread the report that Villafania had swallowed the memorandum, and that he... Cortez had neither seen nor read it, and he had once brought him to trial. When Villafania's statement was taken, he spoke the truth, and with the many witnesses of good faith and credibility whose evidence they took on the case, 
The regular alcalde is jointly with Cortez and the quartermaster Cristobal de Olid gave sentence. And after the Afania had confessed with the priest Juan Diaz, they hanged him from the window of a room where he had lodged. Cortez did not wish that anyone else should be dishonored in that affair, although at that time many were made prisoners in order to frighten them, and to make a show that he wished to punish others. But as the time was not suitable, he overlooked it. Cortez had once agreed to have a guard for his person, and the captain of it was a gentleman named Antonio de Cunones, a native of Zamora, with six good soldiers, valiant men who guarded Cortez day and night, and he begged us, whom he knew belonged to his party, to look after his person, although from that time forth he showed great kindness to those who were in the conspiracy, he distrusted them. Let us leave this subject, and say that he had once ordered it to be proclaimed that Within two days all the Indian men and women that we had captured on those expeditions should be brought, to be branded, and a house was designated for the purpose. And so as to not waste more words in the story about the way that they were sold at the auction, beyond what I had said at other times on the other two occasions when they were branded, if it were done badly before, it was done much worse this time, for after taking out the royal fifth, Cortez took his fifth, and further thefts for captains, and if those we sent to be branded were handsome and good Indian women, they stole them by night from the crowd, so that they should not reappear from them till doomsday, and on this account many women were left out, who we afterwards kept as free servants.